Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin Alhamdulillahi Hamdan Wafi Ni'ama Wa Ikafi Umazidah Ya Rabbana Laka Alhamdu Kama Yambagi Di Jalali Wajhid Wa Azim Sultanik Subhanaka La Nuhsi Thana Al-Ali Anta Kama Athnayta Ala Nafsik Nastaghfiruka Wa Natubu Ilayk Wa Abdul Salati Wa Atamu Taslimi Ala Sayyidi Al-Awwalina Wa Al-Akhirin Wa Alam Al-Sabiqin Wa Qa'il Al-Ghuri Muhajirin Sayyidina wa Mawlana wa Habibina wa Qurrati a'yunina Muhammad Allahumma salli wa sallam barik alayhi wa ala alihi wa ghurri wa yameen wa ashabihi wa shuru al-deen wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yamin deen wa anna ma'ahum bi rahmatika ya arhama al-rahimin Amma ba'd, dear brothers and sisters, we are going inshallah to carry on after speaking briefly about the tribe of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his city and his family and uh, the date of his born now we'll try to go further you know uh, uh, as you may remember those of you who were yesterday here I tried to match this with the Holy Quran with two verse uh, two chapters in the Quran Surah Quraysh and Surah al fil okay again I'll try now for the period before the very revelation Try to understand it first from the Holy Quran. As you may expect, we are going to have very brief and short statement of the Quran, as we expect from the Holy Quran, and they will try to enlighten by some of the narration or uh, statements of the Prophet وسلم, and then we'll try to speak about the most important points, you know, in Syria, you know, because due to short time, you know, we cannot go in details, you know, in mentioning the seerah of the Prophet What I would like to highlight here, three verses in the Quran, I think most of you or all of you, you are familiar with them, you know, they are in Surah Al-Duha, when Allah subhanahu wa said about the previous time of the Prophet he said, Alam yajid ka yateeman fa'awa ووجدك ضالا فهدى ووجدك عائلا فأغنى and this to show the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger he reminded us you know about the position of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم before his revelation okay we highlight the three description yatima means orphan Dallam, this it has different meaning. Comes through it. Aila means poor. Dallam originally don't take this word now, you know. But originally it means misguided. Okay. For sure, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was orphan. And by this, we, when, we, we, when we want to highlight it from Sira and Nabawi Mutahara, we know that according to most of the opinion, his father fa passed away during the pregnancy of his mother, Abdullah. Sayyidina Abdullah, the father of Prophet, uh, Prophet وسلم, he passed away during the pregnancy. This is the strongest opinion. I'm not telling you this. We, are, we have it for sure, okay? We have for sure that he was orphaned, okay? And his mother passed away, according to the strongest opinion, when he was six years old. And then he was sponsored by his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, till he get eight year old, eight year old. And at that age, his grandfather passed away and his uncle Abu Talib, he took care of him till he became under Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. What I would like to highlight, why Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala did mention it as a favor from Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. Because generally speaking, and this is just to make everyone you know, aware of this point, you know, because nowadays, I'm sorry to tell you, many of our children, they are going to be orphans even though their father is still alive, okay? Uh, what do I mean by this? Generally speaking, in all days, even perhaps 50 years ago, the one who has parents 
is going to have good adab, is going to be, uh, he knows how to behave himself, you know, and he knows all etiquettes, you know. Those who miss their parents, you know, they are going to be, in general speaking, we are not giving, uh, we are not giving definite rules, you know, about people. You may have exception of everything, okay? So here, the, those who don't have their parents, you know, they are going to be really uh, chaotic and uh, uh, they have misbehavior all the time, okay? And here, it may be felt as a negative description, okay? When we speak about the Prophet ﷺ, it's positive description. Why? Because in the Prophet ﷺ, no human has interference, okay? And here, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took away his parents, you know, the only one who took care of his behavior and etiquettes is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what has been mentioned by the Prophet ﷺ, أَدَّبَنِي رَبِّي فَأَحْسَنَ تَأْدِيمِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was my master, my teacher, you know, in adab, and uh, he uh, graduated me as a very good uh, be, uh, person, you know, in behavior. You see, yeah, this is maybe felt. Nowadays, I don't know how people, they feel about it, you know. But in old days, they may feel about anyone who is orphan as not that good person, you know, in etiquette or adab or you name it, you know. Here in the Prophet Sallallahu it's praise. Why? Because here the only, the, there's no human interference completely, you know. The one who took care of him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Similar to it, again, you have another name of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or another description, maybe felt as negative one, illiterate. When we speak about illiterate person, We feel that it is a negative, you know, description for people. Why? Because according to our mind and thoughts, this is the only way of gaining knowledge, to know how to read and write, okay? In the Prophet ﷺ, it was positive. Why? Because again, the knowledge of the Prophet ﷺ was given to him only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no interference. I try to give this example usually about it. I say, when I say A in English or I say Alif in Arabic, as a person, you know, I cannot detach myself from the first teacher gave me this letter, you know, and uh, the words which related to it. So here, my knowledge about A or about Alif is not absolute one, it's relative one. Why? Because it's connected to my teacher, it's connected to the word has been used, it's connected to the position I was at. Whereas when the Prophet ﷺ was taught Alif or Alif Lam Mim or you name it, he is the most knowledgeable human or creation about the absolute Alif that perhaps we never tasted it at all. Yes. So is it fair to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the tarbiyah of the Prophet Gave? The tarbiyah. What do you mean by tarbiyah? The raising, the protecting from the harm. Yeah, we mentioned this yesterday briefly when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَإِنَّكَ بِأَعْيُنُنَا You are in our eyes. Yes. Okay. Here Imam Qurtubi, one of the famous uh, interpreters of Qur'an, he said in Arabic form, just go with me a little while, you know. You have difference between the first one and the second two. And the two after it, okay? Yani here in Arabic form, you may say, we are not speaking about Quran, we are speaking, generally speaking, in Arabic. Whenever you want to add on the first sentence, you may say, Alam yajidka yatiman fa'awa wa yajidka ballan Fahada. You have some verses in Quran like this. When you have alam and you connect with the, with the and, you are going to have the same verb. Wayajidka Okay. So here, Qurtubi he said there is difference between this form when you go by this form and when you go by this form. What's the difference? He said the difference. Here, they are the same, completely. Here, we should feel the difference between number two and three and number one. 
You see this? Okay. And here in a hidden way, you should feel the difference between this, uh, these two sentences, you know, and the first one. Whereas when they go all, وَيَجِدْكَ وَيَجِدْكَ, they are completely the same. What do, do I understand from it? I don't know if my understanding is right or wrong. The Prophet ﷺ will confirm that he was orphan. Okay, but he never was in the position of misguided or poor man. What do I mean by this? Okay, misguidance, if it means misguided of the straight path, we have sort of consensus that not only the Prophet, all Prophets, none of them worship any thing except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of his life. Okay? This is the opinion of many scholars, you know, that will not find any prophet or any messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been mushrik or infidel or uh, kafir or whatever in even the shortest period of his time. Okay? This is impossible to have it for any of the prophets. And the Prophet is not an exception of this. He, he is included in this rule. I would rather highlight it by the hadith which narrated by Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib and mentioned in the bazaar. The Prophet said about his time, you know, before prophethood, he said, I haven't ever intended a ma'asiyah. And for sure you know that ma'asiyah or sinful action is much way less than kufr, okay? I have never ever intended any sinful action except two times and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected me in these two times. And this is narrated by Bazaar, Bazaar one of the book written in hadith and the scholars they said ruwatuhu thiqad that means it's sound hadith, okay? So this is add much more on us on our knowledge. The Prophet ﷺ was never during his first life, I mean by first life before revelation, never mushrik, never kafir, never goes with his people, you know, the way they worship the idols. I would rather say much more than this, never practice any sinful doing, and, and as he mentioned in this hadith, he is protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? And here, this is just to tell us, you know, to clarify this point about the early life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi okay? So here, we confirm that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi was orphan. If we go by the way Al-Qurtubi, Mention if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that's been in certain period of time similar to because they are going to be quite similar in certain time of, of uh, uh, certain portion of his life he was misguided but when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the form this not necessarily to confirm it you see yani I are going to show the difference between this one and that one okay is this point clear? And here when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the form to tell you that this is, this description not equal to this. This most probably it goes by the common statement from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya, ya ibadi, O oh my servant, or all oh my slave, all of you, you are misguided except the one I give them guidance. Okay, what does this mean? This means that anyone who is left alone by himself is going to be misguided except the one is given the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by this here, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi without the support of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for sure is going to be misguided. But because he was guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he did not have this misguidance in any portion of his life, okay? And this should be well clear, we should be quite clear about it, you know. It's not similar to one with his orphan state sallallahu alayhi wa because Allah subhanahu wa changed the pattern of it. And in the same way I say about this, I don't mean by not being poor, he had a lot of money. No, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi in all of his life, he did not keep a lot of money. But here he was rich, 
with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yani, the Prophet sallallahu never ever during all of his blessed life, you know, before revelation or after it, showed any need to anyone. And this is the real meaning of rich, in, uh, being rich, okay? And that's what the Prophet ﷺ said. Being rich not to have a lot of money or a lot of uh, merchandise. Being rich to have the inner feeling of rich inside you, yourself. And this is, as we know from many narration about him ﷺ, I'm going to mention of them, you know, that even before his revelation, he used to be too rich, ﷺ. Yes. Again, we should know the personality of the Prophet the personality of the Prophet is not going to speak about himself at all. He's not going to say, I, I, to say I did not commit any sin. He's not, not, he's not going to say I'm the master of humankind. He's not going to say anything without, without instruction from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So, uh, this, your question may be applicable to a person who tends to speak about himself frequently. The Prophet was in completely opposite, you know, way of doing so, okay? Why this mention the Qur'an? Uh, if we have time, we may yeah, go through it or discuss it, you know. We don't have now a lot of time, you know, to discuss it. But for sure, you put in your mind that the Prophet ﷺ said, even this sinful action, you know, did not happen to him before revelation. And this is maybe part of the answer to your question in this regard, okay? But to have him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, saying, I am so and so, he's not going to say, I'm so and so, except he is commanded from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do so. So here about being rich, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why did I give this meaning, even though the first one is the most apparent one, okay? Yani we have this general rule given to us, by all scholars, you know, you go by the apparent meaning. You don't go by the other meaning. Why did I go here by the non-apparent meaning? Firstly, this is was explained by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he defined the meaning of rich, being rich, you know, that this is the inner rich, not the one who is rich with money or merchandise. And besides it, when you inspect the whole narration you know, about him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we mentioned some of them yesterday when Halima got, did we mention it here? I, I, I forgot, you know, or in, the, in Oxford, that when Halima, she got the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she got rich, you know, herself. Okay? When, when they, her shepherd, you know, wants to, uh, to feed the sheep, you know, they are going to return back with very good, you know, uh, amount of milk and you name it. Whereas the others will not have anything available. Uh, uh, when the Prophet used to be in Abu Talib's house, Abu Talib is a poor person, you know, and has some, some short of food and he has a lot of family members, you know. He observed Abu Talib that whenever the Prophet start eating, being the beginner, you know, to start eating, that the food is going to be sufficient for everyone, you know. Whenever anyone besides the Prophet start, uh, began eating, you know, at first, you know, the food is, is not going to be sufficient for the, the family. When he observed this, will not let anyone start or begin before the Prophet And for me, this is the unique sign, you know, of ghina of being rich, you know. And uh, besides that, the narrator said that the Prophet Sallallahu used to uh, be with uh, very nice skin, you know, and fat, and the other people, you know, of Abu Talib, they used to be thin, you know, and very dry skin, and you name it, you know. And this is again a sign of being rich, you know, by Allah. Even so, though he has been fed the same way, the others they have been fed, you know, but here, uh, 
you see the difference, you know, between the description of the holy body of the Prophet Sallallahu and the body of the others. And that's what Imam Musiri mentioned in Burda, Kashhan Mutraf al adami Yani he's too hungry, you know, and has two stones, you know, in his belly, you know, yet this belly is Mutraf al adami Yani this is uh, fatty one, you know, with very nice looking, you know, skin uh, in, the, in that matter. And this really very, يعني, for me, it's very unique and very uh, beautiful, you know, description from Imam al -Busir. So here, why did I, I did not go by the apparent and I went by the other one? Because in all aspect of his life, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, never shown any need or ask anyone anything. I would rather say, one time he was sitting with eight of his companions and he asked them, give me my bay'ah, not to ask anyone anything till you meet me. You see? And he had some of those selected people of his companion had him in the same way that he used to be, sallallahu alayhi wa and not asking anyone anything. I would rather say one day, as mentioned in some of the hadith, he was walking with his uncle Abu Talib. He was perhaps a boy or a young person, you know, and Abu Talib got really thirsty. Okay, and the Prophet ﷺ looked at him, what's going on? He said, I'm too thirsty, you know. And the Prophet ﷺ, by uh, stepping on the land, you know, he has some water and let his uncle, you know, Abu Talib, uh, drink from that water. In another world, you know, even during the young age, he, he used to be وسلم, needed by everyone around him, but not needed uh, his self, you know, in no need of anyone around himself. So I highlight these two or these three patterns about him, sallallahu alaihi or description about him, sallallahu alaihi This is we take it from Holy Quran, okay? And as I said, from the first one, we say, uh, we look to the narration that his father passed away, his mother passed away, and he was in the sponsorship of his grandfather, and then by his uncle Abu Talib after he was eight years old, and. Uh, they mentioned in Sira that Abu Talib loved him in love that never given to any of his children, you know. And this is expected, you know, because this was the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the people surrounding the people, the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, love him a lot, you know. And that's what has been, he prayed, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, once, a poem came to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, I want to make a poem, you know, praising you. And in the first, we call it bait or first unit, you know, of his poem. He said, "In al ilaha bana alayka mahabbatan fi khalqihi wa Muhammadan sallaka." Okay, Allah subhanahu wa taala built for you love in in the hearts of all creation. In Allah, in al ilaha bana alayka mahabbatan. Allah subhanahu wa taala built to you a love, you know, in the hearts of everyone. Wa Muhammadan sallaka. Okay. And those who are familiar, they are knowledgeable in Arabic language, I'm not that good, you know, they say this is one of the most way of praising the Prophet Sallallahu okay, and it gained its importance because this was mentioned in front of him, Sallallahu Alaihi okay, it's not as other nasheed that we have, many of these, they were done after him, but this, he was praised, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, in his presence, you know, this was said by this uh, Abbas ibn Bardas, one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. The other thing that I would like to highlight, and this is from Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described him as, وَإِنَّكَ لَا عَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Characters, Great characters, you know. Generally speaking, it means that he's, he's, this is his nature, okay? And he was created with this nature. Why I'm saying this, you know? Because this nature of him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even before Prophet, this match all characters that has been mentioned in the Quran. Okay, and here he was created, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in this nature of these great characters, you know. And this, this, you know, we are going to 
fully understand the great characters of the Prophet ﷺ, even the prophethood. I did not mention here in this halaqa the story of Zayd ibn Haritha, but those of, of you who heard this story from me, they know very well, you know, what do I mean by this, you know, because this story happened, you know, before even the revelation come to the Prophet ﷺ. The last thing, I'm, uh, it's in the negative pattern. All those matters, they are in the positive. Here you have positivity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all these four verses. The last verse speak in the negative pattern. What do I mean by this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts speaking about his prophet in the last few short chapters, you know, of his holy Quran. The first one was Surah Al-Fil speaking about his birth. Right? Surah Al-Fil, as we mentioned yesterday, spoke about the birth of the Prophet Surah Quraysh spoke about the tribe of the Prophet Surah Quraysh spoke about the tribe. And these are short surahs, you know, and I think many of you, you are familiar with, it, with them, you know. Just go back and try to understand them. We have Surat al Ma'aw. We'll come back to speak about it shortly. We have Surat al Kawthar speaking about the specialties of the Prophet. Then you have Surat al Kafirun speaking about the religion of the Prophet. Then you have Surat al Nasr speaking about the death of the Prophet. Okay, so here when I look at them in this list, you know, I ask myself, what's here? What's going on here in Surah al now? Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed us the description of the Prophet in the opposite way. And by giving the opposite description of the other people, you know, okay? And this is a well-known way in the Quran in describing something, you know, by mentioning the opposite. So here it came by opposite. What do you mean by, by this? Yani when you look about what has been mentioned in this surah and you take the opposite of it, it's going to be the characters of the Prophet And this is one of the way of expression <coughs> in Arabic language. Why did I say so? Because as narrated in Bukhari, his wife Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu anha, when she described the Prophet gave him five different descriptions, if you want to go and read this hadith in Bukhari, for sure this is at the start of the revelation, yani you cannot consider it as come from the revelation, she described him, and when you say that his wife described him, this one of the closest person, you know, to know the Prophet Sallallahu she described him by five different characters, you are going to have them, find them completely opposite to what has been mentioned in this surah, okay? And this is, that's why we said here, we, we may title it as opposite of his, of his character, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The opposite here should be C H after the fly. Okay. Is this po this point clear? Because I would like to have all of these matters, you know, taken to us from the Quran first. And then from the authentic hadith, and then from the seerah that we deal with it, you know, inshallah. Okay. So here after it. We will go briefly, you know, to tell, and I think you are familiar with this, how the Prophet ﷺ, after his birth, how they had this expectation about him ﷺ. His mother, as mentioned by him ﷺ, she was expecting to have something great to happen, you know, and she observed the light coming from her during her birth. Even his grandfather was expecting something, you know, different, and as we did in Syria, that many of people of book and other knowledgeable people, we call them Kohan nowadays, 
uh, those Kohan, by definition, they have some relation with the jinn, and many other persons, you know, they told him about a son that is going to be created or will be born, you know, for him, you know, and uh, in another way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made certain preparation for the family or the people surrounding the Prophet sallallahu before his birth. Okay, and that's why his mother, when she was about to die, she said, I'm going to die, but my fame is going to be quite obvious. You see, and this tells us about how sure and how enlightened they were, you know, about the Prophet She said, I'm going to die, but my fame and my name is going to last and be quite familiar, you know, with each, everyone. So, uh, you know, if I want to repeat that story, you know, when Halima, she came to Mecca with the other women, you know, come from Banu Sa'ad. Banu Sa'ad, they are Bedouin people, you know, from uh, a large tribe called Hawazin, okay, and they came to Mecca seeking to have breastfeeding, you know, of those rich people, you know, because people of Mecca, they used to be rich, you know, and they used to be noble, you know, and in these old days, they used to send their uh, children to the desert to get tough, you know, and uh, know, uh, learn the language the way it should be learned, you know, and uh, to, yeah, there, there are many benefits, you know, of sending them to the to the desert, you know, and uh, uh, Halima, uh, she was looking to have a, 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 a newborn, uh, not orphan. This is what their habit, you know, because as she said, they used to uh, expect the, uh, the good amount of money from the parents or from the father of the, uh, of the child or the newborn. But when she failed to find such a person, she took the Prophet And this, we look at it as a luck, you know. She did not intend, but the luck came to her, you know, by the Prophet And that's what her husband told her next, next, next morning. When she took the Prophet she started breastfeeding him and a lot of milk came to him. And uh, when she offered the other one, uh, the Prophet her friend, uh, taking any milk from it, you know, to leave it to his brother, you know, in breastfeeding. And uh, her uh, husband, you know, he went to the female camel and got some milk from it. And this was the first peaceful night for them, you know, after many nights, many chaotic nights, you know, many, many annoying nights, you know, before this night. And in the morning, the first word he said, لَقَدْ أَصَبْتِ نَسَمَةَ مُبَارَكَ You have gotten a blessed uh, soul, you know, or Halima. And that's what Imam Busiri said, not in Murda in Hamziya. وَإِذَا سَخَّرَ الْإِلَاهُ أُنَاسَ لِسَعِيدٍ فَإِنَّهُمْ سُعَادَ Whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use some of his people, you know, to serve a happy or honorable one, of his people, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that means they are happy, okay? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use them for, the, uh, for an honorable person or happy person, they are going to be honored or happy in this way, okay? And as you may see here, this is without intention. And this is the whole trick behind Wasila. When you make the whistle in the Prophet not necessarily as the others say, they are way, the other one is going to make dua, and he is dead, and this, that. No, here the matter of tawassal has nothing to do with dua, it has nothing to do with being alive or dead, even though we believe that the Prophet is alive, as he's mentioned, but this has nothing to do. You see, this is a matter completely different. Here the Prophet was too young, okay, even when they Almost they were forced to take him because she, she, she felt, felt ashamed you know, to go back without a baby. Yet, they got a lot of benefit from him. You see, and they haven't done, done, done anything you know, to gain this type of, you know, of rich or wealthy pattern that we are speaking about. You know. And I give you, if you let me you know, this hadith, you know, which is really, even though it's controversial, you know, but this is mentioned by the Prophet that a, 
worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This in the old days before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A worshiper, in these old days, the worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they'll quit everything. No family, no business, nothing. They will go away, you know, and worship Allah. From where you are going to feed yourself, you are worshiping. He used to have, yani, uh, live next to a palace of a king. And he has a garbage there, you know. And you know the garbage of the king contain a lot of food. Don't be kings, okay? Don't be kings. Don't throw the food in the uh, garbage, you know. But this, the garbage of the king has a lot of food, you know. And this worshiper, he used to go to that garbage, you know, and eat whatever is left there, you know, for himself. And when <laughs> this king passed away, he moved to far area, you know, and he used to eat from the grass and other things. You know. In the hereafter, as the Prophet said, this worshiper, because he is loved by Allah, he's go Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to tell him, do you know anyone, you know, that you want to make intercession for him? He said, no, I don't know anyone, because he was left alone all of his life. And this person who entered the hellfire is going to be shown to him in very miserable Shame, you know. Do you know this person? Say, no, Allah, I don't know this person. He said, yes, this person was the king that you used to eat from his garbage. And because of that, I'm going to get him out of hellfire and send him to heaven. And if he was, uh, if he know about you, I will not let even let him go to hellfire, okay? And if the, uh, if the king was aware of you that you eat from his garbage, I will not even let him go to hellfire, you see? And this is just to tell us how great is our Allah, so our Lord, you know, and how we try to make ways and wasita and wasila for us from here and there, and how subhanahu wa ta'ala he accept our excuses. And how lucky we are, you know, to have this, the most greatest wasita ever, the Prophet sallallahu okay? Just try to think about these matters, you know, try to live these matters, you know, and try to feel these matters, and try to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with full confidence, you know, because you now you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala much more better, you know, and you know the greatness of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is well documented in the story of Halima, okay? Halima, at least apparently, we don't know, apparently she did not intend to take the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She was hesitant to take the Prophet Yet, when nothing else was left, she took him. And when it happened, the whole life of Halima, not Halima, all family, you know, of Halima, it changed completely, okay? And then, they have the honor, you know, to become Muslim and to uh, see the Prophet وسلم, and to have all matters, you know, which are good, you know, in this life, and inshallah, and the hereafter, the earth. Imam Suyuti mentioned about eight women, they breastfed the Prophet وسلم, not necessarily like Halima, perhaps for one time or, or whatever, you know. Eight women, they breastfed the Prophet وسلم, and I think Imam Suyuti mentioned that all of them, they became Muslim. Those women or the mother in breastfeeding to the Prophet وسلم, they became Muslim. Okay. And just to, uh, let's have this, you know, try to behave ourselves according to it. The Prophet وسلم, for sure is a great man, you know. But usually those great person, you know, with the exception of the Prophet وسلم, when they are great and famous, they tend to forget the others or those who used to be with them in the hard time or in the difficult time. Whereas the Prophet وسلم, when he immigrated to Medina, he used to send money or clothes or any other materials, you know, to Suwaiba. Who is Suwaiba? Suwaiba is a slave woman of Abu Lahab. She was the first woman to breastfeed the Prophet He used to send all the time some good thing, you know, merchandise, uh, clothes, uh, money, you know, to her. And when she passed away, he asked, 
any of her relatives still alive? You see, the Prophet ﷺ even want to give the relatives of her, you know, some of those good matters, you know, in him. Even though bearing in mind, yeah, the Prophet ﷺ in apparent state, we are not speaking about the reality, in apparent state, he used to be hungry all the time. He has the least, you know, amount of... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, anything you know at home when Sayyidina Umar Khattab entered the room that, where the Prophet Sallallahu was there he cannot find anything in the all the room except the Prophet Sayyidina Mawlana and except a leather hand there okay so that's why when someone showed me the picture that this was the assumption of the room of the Prophet Sallallahu according to narration and I saw in that picture you know a lot of things there I told him, no, this is not the room of the Prophet ﷺ. Usually the room of the Prophet ﷺ is empty, you know, you don't find anything there. So here, in such position of living, the Prophet ﷺ used to send all of those good matters, you know, to Suwaiba. And when she passed away, he asked any of her relatives still alive, and he was told none of them still alive. Okay, and as you read in Bukhari, again, that the uncle of the Prophet said al Abbas, he dreamt about his brother Abu Lahab. You know how bad Abu Lahab he used to be with the Prophet and you recite this surah, Surah Al Masad, after this, you know, in the Holy Quran, you know. And he dreamt about him and he asked him, How are you, my, my brother? You know, and he said, I haven't had anything good, you know, from the time I departed from your place except. During Monday, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give me relief because when uh, Thuwayba came and brought me the good news about the birth of the Prophet I felt happy. Okay? And this is just to highlight again the meaning of wasila, the meaning of tawassul. Okay? I want everyone, you know, to be familiar with the meaning of tawassul, the meaning of wasila. Okay? This is whenever you connect yourself or not connect yourself, let's say, whenever you are connected because this may happen from your side or may happen from someone else's side, okay? Whenever you are connected to the Prophet, be sure and be optimistic that you are going to find a lot of good matters, you know, to, to you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I would rather say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encouraged us to do so. He said, وَبَتَغُوا إِلَيْهِ الْوَسِلَىٰ يَا إِلَىٰ الَّذِينَ آمَنَ Address the believer, اِتَّقُوا اللَّهِ Be righteous. Try to find a way of connecting yourself to Allah. Yes. How many what? Okay. All, all children of Halima, who used to be three, two, two daughters and one son, Abu Salama is mentioned and, uh, as one of his brother, you know. Sayyidina Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. Okay. There's a companion, famous companion. The latest they mention him, but I, ha I cannot find it in the previous or in the first scholars, you know. Sayyidina Uthman ibn Maz'oon was mentioned as one of the brothers of the Prophet and blessed Okay. This is to best of my knowledge, was mentioned after nine centuries, you know, uh, according to our available references, you know, you won't find it in the old reference, okay? So those, I think, I don't know if I miss one or two, those are the famous brothers of, and sisters of the Prophet Yes? Could you come to this clause? Which one? This is in Surah Al-Ma'idah. This chapter number number five, verse number. This is, I think, we have time. Okay, this is thirty-five. I think thirty-five or thirty-four. Most, most probably it's thirty-five. This verse number thirty-five in a chapter number four, number five, chapter number five, Surah Al-Maid. Okay. One of the major events, you, you know, they took him back to his mother, you know, but you know how their feeling is going to be, you know, when they have this good experience with this person, you know, among them, you know, they, they took him back 
and they start begging his mother, you know, to keep him with them, you know, and his mother agreed, you know, to send him back with them, you know, and here happened a major event to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he has the opening of his chest and the opening of his heart, you know, and how he was treated, you know, spiritually, you know, some was taken away from his heart and other matters were put in his heart and it was worse, you know, with Zamzam, the famous uh, spring that we know about, you know. Uh, this event, we have some controversy. All of them, I think, they agree that it happened during the time of Halima. He was roughly, so I said, four years old when it happened with the opening of his chest. The others, we have some controversy among them, about them, you know. Uh, most, they said it happened and they, again when he was 10 years old. And this was asked, he was asked, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when was the first time to know that you are prophet? And they, he told them about this story when he was 10 years old, you know, and he had these two angels who come to him and open his chest. And you know, the, the third time was during Revelation, and this he was 40 years old, okay, during Revelation. And the fourth time was when he, at Mi'raj Sharif, you know the controversy about Mi'raj, most of them they said it was three years before immigration, and roughly was 50 years old. So about this, we have some controversy, especially for the last two, okay? And this is, has been accepted, I think, by all scholars, and this is, I think, it's a uh, strong one has been mentioned in authentic hadith, wallahu a'lam, okay? This is about the opening of the chest, of the Prophet ﷺ. And many scholars, they said, this has been highlighted in the Quran, in Surah, Alam Nashrah Laka Sadraq. When you go by the literal translation of it, it's going to be that we open your chest, okay? So, so this is the literal translation of Alam Nashrah Laka Sadraq, the famous surah that we recite all the time. So this event, it took place while he was with Halima, and he was weighed, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, with one hundred, then one thousand, and then one of the angels told the other, if you are going to weigh him with all of his community or nation, is going to be heavier than them, you know. So this event made his mo uh, his mother in breastfeeding return him back to his mother. Okay, she was. And her husband uh, uh, advised her that this is maybe a problematic. They used to believe in jinn and black magic a lot, and they expect that something negative is going to happen to him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And they right away return him back to his mother, and his mother will not let them, you know, go tell. They, they tell, told her about what happened, and she was quite confident. She said, you are afraid for, uh, of uh, something happening to my child. You may go away, you know, I'm in full confidence that nothing is going to happen to her. And this tells us that his mother used to know, or she was quite sure about the position of her son, Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Shortly after it, after that, she took him to visit his father grave you know, in Medina al-Munawwara and to visit his relatives here, Bani Najjar. He was six years old, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and on their way back to Mecca, she passed away, his mother, he was six years old, and according to most narration that she was buried in the, uh, in the midway between Mecca and Medina in a place called uh, Al-Abwa. Al-Abwa, this is a place some of the people, they still know the grave of the mother of the Prophet in that area. By this, for sure, he may not be in need, but by this, he got more uh, bitty feeling, you know, and mercy, mercy feeling, you know, from his uh, grandfather, you know, and in the, of his family, you know, and they used to take significant care of him or sometimes let him do some certain matter that they will not let the other children do it, you know, because they felt that this is a very unique and special uh, boy, you know, uh, among them, you know, and uh, uh, even in, uh, in this time, whenever they have uh, 
stopping of the raining, you know, and you know how important is rain, you know, for such uh, environment, you know, especially in the desert, you know, they used to make istisqa and intentionally, firstly, his grandfather, his life, and then after his death, his uncle, you know, they will try to make the Prophet ﷺ make the dua for the istisqa, what we call istisqa, to have the rain come down. You know. And in, in general speaking, you are speaking about some meaning of وَوَجَدَ كَعَائِلًا فَأَغْنَى فَأَغْنَى يعني Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you efficient from his side and make any and all of you and other people you know, around you in need of you. Even though the Prophet in the apparent way, he was not that rich, he wasn't that strong, he wasn't that this or that, okay? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him all those specialties and qualities, you know, to make everyone around him, you know, keep asking him whenever they have. Then the Prophet moved that to the stage of shepherd, being shepherd, and in one hadith the Prophet said that all the prophets, they had this business, you know, in there. And here, as if this is, you may consider it as training from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how to take care of people, you know. And the Prophet in some of his hadiths, he highlighted the, the business of taking care of the sheep as making the heart soft and making the heart humble, okay, and the uh, opposite of taking care of camels or, or cows, you know. And by this, the Prophet ﷺ told us that he used to uh, do this, you know, for people of Mecca and earn some money of this, of this, you know, to spend money on himself, ﷺ. And when he was 12 years old, he had his first trip to Syria. Again, I, I, I mentioned this before, I'm going to mention it again. The Prophet ﷺ never went to Syria except three times. When he, when he was 12 years old, the second time he was 25 years old, and the third time it was spiritual travel, physical, physical and spiritual traveling, you know, by Isra and Baraj, perhaps when he was 50 years old, okay? But why I should mention this? Because many of the non-Muslim or the Orientalists, they mentioned that he traveled to Syria 50 times, you know, and this is completely incorrect. We don't have anything supporting it, you know, that we have two was physical and one was, even though we believe it was physical, but it was hidden, not known for anyone, you know, except uh, the prophets, you know, and the angels, you know, but not known for the human being of this of that particular time till they were told by the prophets. So here, it was the first visit to Syria, but with his uncle and the Prophet ﷺ reached with it a city called Busra. Busra, this is uh, southern of Damascus. You know, he did not reach Damascus. He reached, this was the last destination, you know. He reached Allah in two of his uh, trips, you know. He reached Busra. He did not go further. Apparently, they have large marketing there, you know. And many of those Meccan, they used to go there, travel for trading in, in Busra. Okay, so when his uncle Abu Talib went to Busra, he asked his uncle to go with him, you know, and he met there in Busra, not in Jordan, in Busra, he met with Bahira, okay, and uh, uh, you have this long story how Bahira, he told that this is the prophet of this time, you know, and he praised the Prophet and showed the people with him some of his miracles, how the shadow of the tree will come to him and you name it, and start asking the Prophet about some of his habit, you know, or how does he sleep and you name it, you know, and uh, uh, all of this. And he didn't know before he was told by the other, I would rather say, his uncle said, this is my son, you know, and he said, no, no way. You cannot be his father, you know, and his father shouldn't be alive now, okay? And as this is, I take it as description of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Baqarah and in Surah Al-An'am, يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاهُ And those people of book, they used to know the Prophet the way they know their children, okay? That's why uh, Bahira was too precise, you know, in his description, you know, about the Prophet ﷺ in this regard. And this is one of the famous 
trip that happened is narrated in Tirmidhi, okay? And the Tirmidhi consider this hadith, and many scholars they consider this as sound hadith, and it's mentioned in all books of Sirah, okay? Here we have some people, you know, who's flying idea. Some will say the whole, the whole Quran was given to him through Bahira, and the other will say this or that, you know, which is, يعني, uh, physically and scientifically, it's almost, not almost, it is impossible, you know, to happen, you know, in this very short visit, you know, which took less than one hour, you know, and uh, by the request of Bahira, he was sent back to Mecca in this manner. Then the Prophet ﷺ stayed in Mecca, what, one of the major events, when he was 13 years old, there was, there was a war between the people of Mecca and people of Ta'if city, which called Saqif and Hawazin, and the Prophet ﷺ attended one of, a few days of, of the fighting, you know, in that time, and he remembered them very well. After that, when he was 20 years old, they have what we call Hilf al Fudur or the treaty. There's a few uh, subdivisions, you know, of the Meccan people. They gathered in a house of a famous general person of Mecca and they made a treaty among themselves. Yani, when, whenever they say anyone treated unjustly in Mecca, because as you may say, in these old days, you know, the stranger in the tribal system doesn't have any value, you know. You may kill him, you may take his money or whatever. And those people, they gathered in this house just to support any stranger come to Mecca. And the Prophet ﷺ praised this street, you know. He, he said, after Islam, if I'm invited to such a street, I'm going to go, you know, and uh, meet with, uh, and have the treaty with the other people. These are the major events happened to him ﷺ uh, before his marriage to Sayyid Khadim, yes? Hmm? Damascus? No, physically no. Yes. Uh, this that stayed in prison. In prison? No. Where? In Mecca. In Mecca? I'm not aware of this. Anyone of you heard this, you know, that he was in prison? If you bring this to me, you know, I, I may get much, much more knowledge you know, about it. You know, I'm not familiar with it. Shall we have a break for uh, 10 minutes or carry on or what? We'll have a break for 10 minutes, okay? If anyone has any question you know, about what we have mentioned, you know, to be relevant, you know, to what we have mentioned, we'll try to answer it. Otherwise, we'll carry on, shall Zero for 20th of August. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa abdur salati wa atam taslimi ala sayyidina Muhammadin al-Sadiq al-Amin. Al-Mabrousi rahmatan lil alameen wa ala ali wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma la sahla illa ma ja'alta hu sahla wa anta taj'al al-hazna ila shayka sahla. اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا زدنا علما وفقهنا إذا علمنا فرصت أن إذا كان أي سؤال أو أي كلاريفيكيشن أو أي كومنت في ما بعد ما تفعلنا إذن إن شاء الله نكري أون وين بي هاد الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم أسمع في بعض الأحيان كتو فرابل وذات رابين Roots of Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu anha. And this may be considered as a turning point, you know, turning uh, point in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because, uh, as you may know, there is some turning point, you know, in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this may be considered one of them, you know, before. Uh, his revelation, for sure the most major one is the revelation in his life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But this is because when he didn't know Sayyidah Khadija and got married to her, she had a significant role in the life of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as she was praised by him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, uh, he went there, you know, uh, to have a deal with Sayyidah Khadija and he traveled with her 
slave who used to be called Maysara and apparently Sayyida Khadija she has some background of knowing that there is a prophet or messenger to be sent you know, among the Arab and she was have has her own expectation about this and that's why she instructed her slave to observe and inspect very well you know, about the conditions of this person. Turn it off. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ went there in this second trip he did not meet with any of people of book, you know, or the monks or uh, priests or you name it, you know. In the first trip when he was 12 years old, he met with Bahira. In the second one, he never met with any of them. But Maisara was asked by one of them, who is this person, you know, and gave him a hint that he may be the prophet of this nation. And uh, alhamdulillah, he was successful, sallallahu alayhi wasallam in his uh, trading, you know, and have a significant uh, uh, gaining money, you know, they gained money and he returned back and even they said they had the double expected, you know, uh, profit from these goods, which is not surprise, you know, because whenever uh, he get involved in any of these matters, you know, since his birth, you know, till his death, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you are going to find the barakah, the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This reminds me about what Sayyidina Jabir ibn Abdullah said. He said, when he was given money from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in certain occasion, and he lived, lived after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than 60 years. And he, he said, Whenever I invest this money is going to find the barakah in it in different way than I have in any of the other money or uh, that I gain. You know. Bearing in mind, after the Prophet وسلم, in Madir Munawar, they have a lot, huge amount of money coming all the time, you know, due, especially in the time of Sidam al Khattab. But he said those few great the uh, coins were given to him by the Prophet وسلم, it was a different story, it was significant. So here, here it's not surprised that the one who is not familiar with this matter, he may feel some of exaggeration, okay? But this is the reality of him, وسلم, whenever he is get involved in any matter of this life or the hereafter, regardless of the intention made by the, the others, you, they are going to find the difference, they are going to find the blessing, they are going to find the good, they are, they are going to find the decency. You know? And this is, we should be familiar with it. This is, some may say, all people, you know, of any follower of any religion is going to say the same, okay? Yes, he may say the same. Okay, he may praise his prophet who is much more than what we praise a prophet. He may say is a god, you know. But here the point: if you have two significant major points, the first one, these are stories. We did not live this this era, so we should have the right transmission about it. And here, I think anyone try to collect about the Prophet in this regard is going to find a pile, you know, of those matters, you know, all support this this matter, okay? We, we, uh, as a matter of fact, we don't deny about the other, because even say Naisa, uh, when he was newborn, he said, وَجَعَلَنِي مُبَارَكًا أَيْنَمَا كُنْتْ I'm a blessed, Wherever, you know, I, I, I am at, you know, and this is, we believe in it, okay. But we don't have the details of it the way we have it about our Prophet Sallallahu okay. And again, we should look at this point. Uh, some Muslim out of being fair, their uh, standards, they will, they will say, this is nothing, you know, because everyone speak as such, you know, about their prophet. And by this, you know, when they look at the result that these people that are good in their characters, they don't lie, don't, they don't do this, they don't do that, they feel that they are the same. And here we have real problem, okay? We should have significant recognition about 
these matters in a scientific way. We are not speaking here about our emotions or about our love or about uh, uh, tradition that we heard this from our parents or this or that. We speak about it from the scientific way. Okay, And you never ever have anyone had this pile of data that about his blessing, you know, that we have it about the Prophet And this is one of them, and not, not more or less. Uh, when uh, he traveled for Sayyidina Khadija and had the train, training, he has more than the expected, expected, you know, uh, increasing in her money, you know, and in her profits, you know, in this mat matter. And she, out of her generosity, again, she gave him double uh, the, the price. And uh, this is what has been termed some, uh, in some book of Sirah, they said it was Mudaraba. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ deserved to have the double of it, you know, because it's according to the percentage of uh, what, whatever is gained as money. When my seller returned back and told her about the hal or the state of the Prophet ﷺ, and some of his characteristic uh, description. And she observed some of them because uh, as Bahira said, and as mentioned you know, in Sira, he, herself also she, also she uh, observed some angels you know, uh, making like a uh, shadow for the, the Prophet to protect him from the sun uh, and uh, the sunshine, you know, especially in the hot days, you know. This is, was observed by Bahira, this was observed by Maysara, and this by, was observed by Sayyidah Khadija herself. And out of all of those matters, she got interested to get married to him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She was married to two persons before her, before him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, with some controversy which one was the first, you know. But we know for sure that the children of the Prophet ﷺ, so Sayyidah Khadija, they have their brothers, you know, maternal brothers, you know, related to Sayyidah Khadija. They are uh, three, two of Abi Hala, Hind and Hala, and two, uh, and one from the other one called Hind also. And one of these three children was raised up in the house of the Prophet ﷺ. And he, for us, he gave us the best available description for us to the Prophet The Prophet was described by many of his companions. You may not know about it, you know, but we have in some narration description of the physical body of the Prophet by Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq. Okay. Uh, but the most famous people, you know, or persons to describe the Prophet were those who used to know him before revelation and were raised up in in his house, like Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib and Hind ibn Abi Hala, or those who used to be too young in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, like Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik and Barat ibn Azim. These are the most famous narrator in describing the Prophet ﷺ. So, some of the adult, the smart, the uh, intelligent uh, companion, like Sayyidina Abu al As, he said, when I became Muslim, I cannot even gaze to the Prophet ﷺ. And if they ask me to describe him, I cannot describe him. You see? And this was the common attitude of the uh, adult companion. That's why most of these descriptions, they came to us through the younger generation, you know, of the companion. Sayyidina Bala ibn Azim, Anas ibn Malik, ibn Abi Hala, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and some others, you know, uh, of this type. You know. And they said in the majlis of the Prophet وسلم, you are going to find all the companions as if they have a bird in their head and their head is down, you know, except Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Amr. They used to look at the Prophet وسلم, and the Prophet would look at them and they used to smile to the Prophet and the Prophet smiled toward them. And this was special way of relation and this is again of, of no surprise you know when you go and visit Medina now and you see how close is the grave of Sayyidina Bakr and Sayyidina Umar to the Prophet you know for sure that this unique relation that they have 
in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's why when Sayyidina Zayl Abidin, a famous person of al Bayt, he was asked about the relation or the, how close Abu Bakr and Umar they used to be to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, in the same pattern that we see nowadays. Okay. And we know from the, the reading that uh, the competition, you know, to get buried you know, in the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was among many other companions or very close persons, you know, to the Prophet ﷺ, and this is, wasn't, did not take place for any of them except for Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar. We believe that Sayyidina Isa Maryam, when he show up later on, you know, he's going to be buried there in, that, in the same place. And that's what has been mentioned, I think, in Sunan al-Darim and other areas, that they said there is, uh, Toward the east, there is a, an empty space there prepared for Sayyidina Isa ibn Mar Maryam to be buried in that particular place. So, she sent someone in a hidden way because in their time, you know, the women, they are not, usually they don't ask the man to get to get married, you know, the, the man should initiate this, you know, and she said in a hidden way, someone to the Prophet ﷺ to try to pay his attention about Sayyidina Khadija, and Sallallahu ﷺ got engaged with to her, you know, and they have a gathering between the noble of both families, you know, because both of them, they were noble families, you know, of, of Mecca, and the well-chosen person, you know, from both sides, they gathered, you know, as nowadays. Unfortunately, nowadays, this gathering doesn't mean anything, okay? Yani, I'm going to bring my father, I'm going to bring my uncles and everyone, you know, but whenever there's any problem, no one has the right to have any interference, okay? In old days, perhaps 50 years ago, back in our countries, when we have any problem, those elderly, those noble peer person, you know, of the families, they will hold the responsibility. They are responsible for anything may happen in this house. As if the 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 the, the male, the, the person who came to the house of the female, as if he's telling the other side, these are my people that they have the effect on me. If there's something wrong, go and buy me. Those are the one who will have their judgment on me. I'm going to listen to them. And from the other side, they are going to show those who have the effect on the woman, you know. And that's what has been mentioned in the Quran. فَبَعَسُوا حَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهِ وَحَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهَا You should have some authority from this side and some authority from the other side. You know. well, nowadays, just throw it in the sea, you know, in the ocean, and uh, let it be according to the luck, you know. If this is good man, the woman is going to have good life, otherwise she is going to be too miserable, you know, and stuck there, you know. When she asks any of us, you know, no, haram, you cannot make divorce, you know, because you, because you cannot divorce yourself, you know. Uh, if you did not put it as a condition you know, at the beginning, you cannot divorce yourself, okay? And she is going to have too miserable life, or some of them, you know, according to the way they work here, you know, she is going carelessly to go and get married to another person which is completely, you cannot imagine it, you know, to have women, you know, in the isma of two persons, you know, she is going carelessly to go and, يعني, all of these problems that we live nowadays has been instructed to us under the name of freedom. Okay. Whereas the Prophet ﷺ gave this as a sign, إِذَا هَلَكَ الْوُعُولُ وَظَهَرَ Okay. Anything in this life, you should have a reference for it. When you speak, speak about medicine as a profession, you should have some people who are in authority in this. And in such a country, they don't bypass this, you know. They are very good, you know, at establishing something, certain regulation, uh, certain references, you know, for this profession. And that's why they are significantly developed, you know, in these sciences, developed in their work, you know, in their job, okay? But, 
when you look at the social matters out of the name of liberty and freedom, the same people, exactly the same, who has all of those uh, supervisors and all of those references, you know, on all aspects of way of living and uh, in the social matter, out of the name of freedom, they don't have any. And anyone has the right to do whatever he wants to do. And that's why you feel ashamed sometimes to speak about some of those ugh or those uh, which even the animals, they are not going to practice these relations, you know, you are going to find it. And that's what has been summarized by the Prophet by Halaka al wa zaharat tuhut. al wurul that's mean those who are masters, or those who are chiefs, okay? And they be, it should be in all aspects of the life. In the profession, professional matters, in the families, each family should have some chiefs there, you know, in the uh, community, in the city, in the town, and in, you name it, okay? When you have them as a sign of the hereafter, as nowadays, gone, all of them, they are gone. Zaharat tuhut, okay? What is that tuhut? Those who are now. This has nothing to do with your scale, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You may be the best person ever, okay? But you don't know how to speak. You see, in public, you don't know how to speak. Or you don't know how to handle this problem. How do you don't know? All of us, we are deficient, okay? And those people, in general speaking, when they are ch chosen, they should be chosen in a way that those are good speakers, these are politicians, these are uh, uh, good handler of the problem, and you name it, okay? But no, I'm free. I'm not going to listen to my uncle. I'm not going to listen to my uh, elderly person, you know. Uh, that's why we are, we are create, creating these problems. And all of us, we suffer of it. Okay, why? Because there's no reference. Even the time of the Prophet when they had these war prisoners, you know, and the, the Relatives of the war prisoners, they came to the Prophet ﷺ, this in Ghazwat Hunayn. They want to free their women and their children, you know. And the Prophet ﷺ intended to free them. And he was the leader. He did not find himself in the authority to speak in behalf of everyone. Because this... They were divided. Before division, he has the right to speak that those who were collected, I'm going to send them back. You know. But after division, he waited, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He waited for 15 days without division, you know, waiting for these people to come and speak with him. And they did not come. And he divided them. After the division, they came. <laughs> okay? They came, they want their family back. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stood on the pyramid. He said, those people, they came and they want, uh, and I want to give them. So whoever of you gives them without any compensation, that's it. The one who wants compensation, we are going to compensate him later on. Out of his generosity, so always he used to be generous, you know. Whenever he doesn't have money, if, he, if a person comes to him, you know, asking for money, he will not say no or I have nothing. He will tell him, go to so and so. Borrow some money from him in my name that I'm going to pay back this name. Okay. So here, what did he say? He's uh, as narrated in Bukhari. This is narrated in Bukhari. He said the one who is agreeable to give it without compensation, that's it. The one who, who wants compensation, I'm going to compensate him later on. Okay. And uh, as usual in the mosque, yes, no, yes, no. Yes. The professor said, I did not know who did. Uh, said yes and would it say no. Go back to your authorities. We call it in Arabic, Arif. This tells us, as narrated in Bukhari, that each group of people in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, or each tribe, or you name it, you know, they have a representative, they have a chief, they have Arif, what we call Arif today. He said, Sallallahu go back to your Arif, and let all of these urafa or those heads or those chiefs, you know, come to me and tell 
not going on. For my side, I'm going to speak in behalf of myself. He's the greatest one in Bani Hashim, the greatest one in all human, you know. I'm going to speak in behalf of Bani Abdul Muttalib. We, Bani Abdul Muttalib, we don't need anything, any compensation. He spoke about himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and about his direct family. He did not speak even about the other companion or whatever. He waited for everyone. You see, this is the point I'm trying to say. Sorry, we went يعني, out south, uh, the subject, you know, but this is, has been narrated in Sirah just to tell us how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is the greatest man ever, Allah designated to him. And you, whenever you want to be happy in your life, you should be according to this designation. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the greatest man ever, he went, he was too young, you know, and he took with him those elderly, Abu Talib, who, and his uh, other uncles, you know, of him, Abu Lahab, and you name it, you know, those are uh, considered as high figures, you know, in the tribe or the, in, the, in their community, you know, before the revelation. Okay? And this is the point that we should, يعني, uh, anything we speak about Sira or whatever, let's try to find the match of it, you know, in our life. Let's try to try, try to understand it. Why the Prophet ﷺ did not go by his own, you know? Why did he go with his uncles, you know, this? He doesn't know how to speak. He doesn't know how to handle the matters. No, this is to teach us. To teach us. And this is, should be the way. And he, now, don't feel too happy that you brought with you those high figure, you know, in the, in the family, you know, because you are not going to listen to any one of them if a problem happened, you know. And this is, doesn't, for me, doesn't make any sense, you know. Even we have the same problem back in Syria now, we'll choose, you know, when the, the prior will go, you know, to, his, uh, to the house of the, his wife, you know, they will choose with those who are high figures, you know, this at the beginning and take them with him. You know. I understand it as whenever any problem, these are the persons that they have their influence on me, okay? And this is, as I said, this is mentioned in the Quran, in, par in, in particularly, it, it's men mentioned about the marriage, okay? Whenever you have problem in the marriage, you should assign a representative from this side and a representative from the other side. Not nowadays, Ibn Juzay, who passed away in the eighth century, he said, this hasn't been practiced for a while. <laughs> He's speaking about his time, you know. Nowadays he said, how bad we are, you know, we don't, we don't have this practice, you know, in our time, you know. So, uh, really, I'm speaking seriously, okay. Let's try to find a way, a way you know, of returning back these old habits, you know. Not to be that developed, you know, because we don't know, we don't, we don't know, we don't need this development in these matters. So he went there, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you see, Abu Talib was quite clear, you know, about description, the, describing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He de described him from the positive points. Myself, I feel all of his points, they are positive. And described from what may be felt as negative point. He did not hide it. He said that, my nephew, you know, when you compare him in his characters with anyone of the Arab is going to be much better than them. Even though he doesn't have a lot of money. Okay. For me, for me, this doesn't mean a lot, you know. But uh, in many societies, many communities, and perhaps in that uh, gathering, it may mean something. And he said about it, you know, said in a full mouth about it, he said he doesn't have a lot of money. وَإِنْ كَانَ فِي الْمَالِ قِلْفَ أَنَّ الْمَالَ ظِلٌ زَائِرٌ That is, this money is just for this life and it's going to be gone away like, like a shadow, how the shadow it come and go, right, the same. And here, <coughs> again we should be open to this matter. When you start such a uh, honorable relation, you know, marriage or, or when you meet with one of your friends, you know, in such a setting, you know, in Halaqa or in the mosque or whatever, let's not be deceptive, okay? Let's not be يعني, having the masks, you know. One of our major problems nowadays is that we wear a lot of masks, you know. I'm sorry to tell you, I really I felt bad because when I someone give, give me these dresses, you know, I, oh, how, how what is this, you know? 
not good at all, okay? You should look at the inner, which is too bad, okay? Don't look at the outer. The outer doesn't mean anything. In Allah, Allah is not going to look at Allah is not going to look to our dress or to our uh, talk or how fluent we are in this language or fasaha or you name it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to look at our hearts. You know? And this is what is going to count for us, you know. Okay, nowadays we may deceive ourselves, you know, we may speak about it. And see, I cannot imagine so anything beyond this. And such a great personality, like the Prophet ﷺ, was great in all of his aspects, you know. And uh, the desire to get married to him came from the other side. Yet his uncle, you know, this authority, when he spoke about him, he mentioned something that may be felt negative, you know, from the other side. Just to be clear in all of his matter. And we know, we don't need to explain, you know. We know the barakah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put there. Okay. And this is an indirect way. Allah telling us, okay, when you do it this, the, the way it was done for, for my beloved person, the Prophet sallallahu when you do it in the same way, I'm going to give you barakah more than expected. To what extent? To the extent that the Prophet ﷺ, even himself, you know, his barakah wherever he goes, you know, when he was told by some of his wives later on that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you better than Khadija, he said, no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give me better than Khadija. And he starts speaking about the specialties of Khadija. I have children from here, I did not have children from the other wives. Okay? And this is just to tell uh, uh, ourselves, you know, that all children of the Prophet ﷺ were from Khadija, with the exception of Sayyidina Ibrahim, who was from Mary. And Mary wasn't a wife of the Prophet ﷺ, okay? So namely, uh, according to most of the references, the Prophet ﷺ has six children from Sayyidina Khadija. And according to most of them, you know, all of them, they were born before revelation, okay? And uh, elderly among them is Sayyidina Al-Qasim, Qasim, the son of the Prophet, and then he has four daughters, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The elderly one, Zainab, then Ruqayya, then Umm Kulthum, then Fatima. We have a lot of controversy, but this is يعني, the most clear one, you know, in my mind, you know, this order, you know. Zainab, Ruqayya, uh, Umm Kulthum, and Fatima. And then perhaps uh, someday said Abdullah was born in Islam. يعني, I should... Uh, give exception of this, they, some of the many authors, they said that why, that's why he used to be called Al-Tayyib and Al-Tahir. And according to most of our references, you know, Al-Tayyib and Al-Tahir, they are other names of Abdullah. He was called Al-Tayyib and Al-Tahir because he was born during Islam. And uh, Sayyidina Al-Qasim, Sayyidina Abdullah, they were buried surrounding the grave of their mother, you know. Whereas the rest of the children of the Prophet ﷺ, they were buried in Baqiyah in Medina al Munawwarah, the daughters and Sayyidina Ibrahim. Yes? Other name of? No, no other name. This is her name. Um Kulthum. Yes. Um Kulthum, this is her name. Yeah, it is a good question. Because it may be felt that um so and so means that this is not her real name. Because in Arabic language we have Abu Fulan, Abu so and so, or um so and so. And this is maybe another name and maybe the original name. Okay. Yes. Um, some questions from that side. Yes. Um, there is an opinion that said that Khadija was 28 at the age of marriage. How strong is that opinion? It's too weak. Yeah, let me broaden this. The question is that the Sayyidina Khadija was 28 when she got married to the Prophet ﷺ. I heard this, you know, and I said it with some people, you know, who spoke as such, you know. And we have another person who had a long, large study that Sayyidina Aisha was not nine, nine year old when she got the, the, to the married to the Prophet ﷺ and he was 50 or around 50, 48, 49 or 50, okay. 50, he was 50. So, here, please, don't take any piece of information of the Prophet ﷺ according to our standards, okay? For sure, in my, in my opinion, you know, the age has significant role, okay? Uh, nowadays, they speak about the early marriage, you know, and how bad is it, you know? 
For me, this is completely wrong. Okay, I don't believe in it. Okay, M most of the speakers nowadays speak about marriage. They say it's too bad. Okay, I don't feel as such. Okay, so here, let's don't subject our religion to our current life because what's good now today may be bad tomorrow. Okay, and what's uh, bad today may be good tomorrow. Okay, so try. To fool ourselves, you know, by saying, say the Khadija was 28, <coughs> say the Aisha was 16 or 18, I don't know how much they said, you know, and this and that, and fool ourselves. What we are trying to say? We are trying to jeopardize what has been steady and will establish. Okay? We have those matters, you know. He said this person, this is only Hisham ibn Urwa narrated that Sayyidah Aisha was as such. And I brought to him a list, you know, of 15 person. 10 of them, they are relative of Sayyidah Aisha. They said she was nine years old. Okay. And here, to fool ourselves and to say, يعني, all of this, they are going to make them self sound reasonable, you know. Uh, say that Aisha did so and so, and when she, when, it, when anyone is going to do so and so, should be at this age. And so you go by those indirect way of analyzing, you know, and you leave all of this pile of data that you have, which give you the exact date specifically. Okay? And this has been done even for the Prophet Sallallahu Okay? Yani, regardless what you've said, you know, the other they are going to you know, they say, no, this is Quran was, the, was made by the Prophet In the same pattern, okay? And yani here, they are fooling themselves, you know, as if they are trying to close their eyes, you know, about the sun which is shining, you know, and try to find a small light here or there, you know, or small darkness, small spot of darkness, you know, to inspect these matters, you know. And as Muslims, we should free ourselves of this, okay? And either you go by what has been narrated, I will say, I don't know if this doesn't match with your feeling. Nothing wrong to have something in your feeling different than what happened in the seerah, okay? But for myself, when I have something in my, inside myself different than the prophet's, prophetic tradition or different than the Quran, I should... Uh, Pick up this problem and consider problem in me, not problem in the Prophet or problem in the Quran. You see, because I'm Muslim. Okay. So here, for sure, I may have the same imagination. I get married to a woman, you know, 15, 15 year old, you know, older than me. Okay. But here, is this applicable to every woman? Do you have young women who look old and old women who look young? Is it possible or not? Okay. Sheikh Al-Akbar, he said, one of my shiuch is a woman, was above 90 years old, 9-0. And when you look at her face as if she is 15 years old, I, I feel shy to look at her face, he said. You see, and here you have all these possibilities. Okay. Let's, again, if the Prophet Sallallahu Muhammad ibn Abdullah got married to Khadija bint Khuayrid, who was 40 years old. This person is much more beloved to me than if you have Muhammad ibn Abdullah get married to a woman of 20 years old. Okay, this is my idea, this is my opinion. Why? Because I feel what, whatever has been prepared for the Prophet, designated for the Prophet, is the best ever. Okay, and that's what the Prophet said. And here we, we, we take it as general rule for all aspects of his activity and, and his life, sallallahu But here in particular, after that, he got married, sallallahu alayhi wa Perhaps most of his wives, you know, after that, he, they were younger than him. And said Aisha was much younger than him, you know. And when he was, was told that uh, you have been given someone better than her, he said, no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give me someone who is better than him. Okay. How? Yani this is for me the minimal requirement for all of us. Okay. Don't translate in your life and for sure in the Prophet's life 
everything to the materialism. Okay? And this has been summarized by the Prophet The Prophet did not deny the point of beauty, did not deny the point of family, did not <laughs> deny the point of being rich, you know, the woman, you know, but he highlighted much more than the point of being religious, okay? He highlighted four, four of them to us, وسلم, and gave the preference to one of these four, okay? And we should be as such. And I don't know how right I am. Now, why we have this sharp climbing, you know, rate of divorce? Because most of those marital, you know, relation, they are built in materialism. And you see how life, the young is going to get old and the beautiful will get ugly, you know, and the rich will get poor, you know, and you have it, okay? But whereas, when we look at those other matters that the Prophet ﷺ looked at in Khadija, I highlighted once yesterday, you know, and for me this has moved my heart, my heart a lot, you know, this just to know this one fact, you know, about say the Khadija made me go upside down, you know. So uh, without knowing the other factors you know, of say the Khadija, you know, and we should really look about those matters, you know, because you may look at spouses, you know, you feel they are not that happy, and they pay, perhaps they be, may be the happiest ever, you know, in this time, you know, because because they have some spiritual relation, okay, not materialistic one, you know. And those who are going to stick to the materialism, you know, age, money, beauty, you name it, you know, they are going to be the most miserable. Those who knows the fact about the soul relation and other matters, they are going to be much better in this regard. Okay. So again, I'm not telling you, this is not Quran, when we say that Sayyidina Khadija was 40 years old, this is not Quran, this is not definite, this is not certain, but most of the narration they said as such. When I want to give preference, I may sometimes, I may sometimes give preference of the other narration, not the famous one, but should be in my sight for good reason. Okay. Firstly, I, to be honest with you, I never have this is, you know, in books, you know, I heard from the people, you know, saying that she was 28 years old, okay? From where did it come, I'm not sure now, okay? I haven't seen any narration similar to this. Anyone who came across this, you know, please show it to me, you know, I'll get some benefit, okay? To give preference of such narration over the other, for myself, I'm not speaking about that. That's mean. I did not like Khadija bint Khwailid, the 40-year-old lady. Inshallah, I'm going to meet with her in the hereafter. How am I going to meet with her if I did not like her? This old lady, ugly lady, and she was completely opposite of all my thoughts. How am I going to meet with her? How am I going to see her? You see? Just put this in your mind, okay? You should hope to meet with your mother, okay? And when you have some description of your mother that you did not like, okay? And you give preference to something else, and this wasn't the reality. How are you going to meet with him? And yeah, with this, uh, just, uh, yeah, this concern me, this doesn't concern anyone else, you know? You may speak whatever. So again, I haven't have any proof, you know, or any innovation that she was 28 year old, you know. Alhamdulillah, she was 40 year old. She uh, gave, gave birth of six children to the Prophet Sallallahu The only children ever he has, with the exception of Sayyidina Ibrahim, he has good life with her. He did not get, get married to any woman during the time of Khadija bint Khuwailid. And she uh, made his house, you know, too peaceful and with full sakina that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called him Ya Ayyuan Mizzamil Ya Ayyuan Muddas. Other questions? Um, what was the specific trade Sayyidah Khadija was involved in? Now I don't recall. I think it's mentioned, you know, because the, these Qurayshi, they used to be all of the merchants, you know, they will send goods to Yemen, which is not available there, and bring goods from Yemen. 
and send these goods, you know, from Yemen to Syria and bring something from Syria to Yemen. You see, yeah, because they are the midway between Yemen and Sham, they send to, as, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Holy Quran, رِحْلَةَ الشِّتَاءِ وَالصَّيْفِ I know, I, I, I'm not quite sure now, but I know that from Yemen they used to uh, bring, you know, clothes. They were uh, good, you know, in manufacture and uh, uh, those clothes, you know, to have a burd, a burd in Yemeni. This was famous one, you know, and that's what Sayyidina Mu'az ibn Jabal told the people of Yemen when the Prophet Sallallahu sent him there. He t t told them, give me as a substitute of Lord Zakah, give me clothes because, because this is easier for you and much more beneficial to the people of Medina. Okay, so I imagine that they used to play, bring you know, clothes from Yemen, perhaps from Syria they used to bring, bring some yani, weeds and other things you know, to, for, to be eaten, you know, because Syria and this all this used, used to be yani, famous in agriculture and other matters, but I'm not quite sure about it. Could you please clarify the names of the sons of Sayyidina Khadija again, please? Say no. Shall I write them down? Sorry, this is before the marriage, say this. What before? Before the marriage? Okay. Sayyidina Khadija got married to two persons before the Prophet. The one is called Abu Hala at Tamimi. And this is from other tribe. This is not from Quraysh. Tamim is very large tribe. They used to reside in what we call Najd nowadays, in the middle or eastern region you know, of uh, Arab Peninsula. And there's another person called Atiq ibn Abid al Makhzumi. Makhzum, this is from Quraysh, this is another section, this is the section of Sayyidina Khalid ibn al-Walid, okay? From this section, she was married to a person there. Then she got married to the Prophet From the first, if this is the first, we have controversy, if this is the first or this is the, the, the first, we have some controversy. Most, they said the first one was Abu Halat Tamimi, and from this marriage she has two female, two males. One is called Hala. Hala is name of female, but this is name of male, and the other one called him. Two males we have from the first marriage. And from the second one, she has one called him, but this is female. These are males. Okay. And from the Prophet, she had six children Qasim wa Abdullah, Zainab. وَرُقَيَّ وَأَمْ كُلْسُومُ وَالسَّيْدِ فَعْلَ Okay, yes? I think she still have the business here, okay? I think she still has the business. I heard recently, I never read in book, you know, and all this uh, statement, you know, I have a lot of concern about them. You know, you may hear some of them. I heard this statement, I never read it, that after the marriage, Sayyidah Khadija gave all of her wealth to the Prophet I told them this is impossible. Why? Because the Prophet is not the person who is interested in this money. And secondly, this comment, it comes from a person who loves money a lot. You know? <coughs> and the relation between the Prophet and Sayyidina Khadija was much, much, much more higher than money relation. Okay? And you may expect this from two spouses or two persons who has their best relation is money, okay? And this is, wasn't the case with Sayyidina Khadija. That's why I feel a little bit hesitant, you know, about those comments that I hear them nowadays, you know. But some may feel this is great matter from Sayyidina Khadija. She, she gave all of her money, you know, to the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet Sallallahu is not going to accept this, not going to ask for this, okay? And uh, his relation with Sayyidina Khadija was much higher than uh, these purposes, you know. 
I, I, I look at these purposes or at these targets, you know, as materialistic matter. Other questions? Yes? Yes. Make it loud to, to make everyone hear you the question. Yeah. How, do women, how do women model themselves to be like Saviour? Good question. Why? Because the Prophet gave the title of the best women and he named four of them. The best women ever, you know, created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are four. They are Asiya, Imra'at Fir'aun, the one who mentioned Quran, Khadi, uh, Maryam, Sayyidi Maryam, the mother of Sayyidina Isa, uh, Khadija bint Khuwaylid and Fatima bint Muhammad. This is, I think they said this sound hadith, is not in Bukhari, this is in Mustadrak al-Hakim. This is sound hadith that these are the best four women ever. Okay. And uh, I think all, all females in this side, they should look forward, you know, to try to mimic, try to get some of the stories, some of the characters, you know, of these four women, you know, to get better and better. Sayyidah Khadija, this is mentioned in Fath al-Bari li Ibn Hajar. They said, you don't find it in Sirah. Before the revelation, after the marriage to the Prophet ﷺ, she used to treat the Prophet ﷺ in very noble and very high, sophisticated way. To the extent the Prophet ﷺ got surprised, okay? And here, I'm sorry to say this, you know, don't scale your relation with your husbands, you know, according to your time, okay? You should have it much more better than this. So here, what I'm trying to say, say the Khadija, her treatment to the Prophet in their time, which almost, yani, the woman in these old days, it, uh, she used to serve the man completely, you know. She was much more than this to the extent the Prophet got surprised. What's going on? Why? Yani, you do it in this way. And he asked her, he asked her thoroughly, why do you do so to this extent? And she said, because I suspect that you are the prophet of this nation. And this is narrated in Tariq Makkah al-Azraqi, as, uh, as uh, Imam Ibn Hajar said in Fath al-Bari. And look at the answer of the, of the Prophet and see how He's going to practice his slavery to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why I'm saying so? The Prophet sallallahu in one sitting on Majlis in his company, he was asked, when did you know yourself that you are Prophet? And he answered what we said yesterday when he was 10 years old, you know, when the angels, they came to him, you know, when he was in the desert and opened his chest. So here, he did not put his feet, you know, on the table and say, yes, I am the prophet. <laughs> okay, what did he say? Why? And you should understand this point. The absolute is Allah only, period. Nothing is absolute in this life. He said, listen, if I am the prophet, you are going to see what you are going to have. If I'm not the prophet, the Lord of that Prophet is not going to forget you. That's what he said, okay? He said, if I'm the Prophet, you are going to see what's going to happen, okay? If I'm not the Prophet, the Lord of that Prophet, if I'm not that Prophet, you know, is not going to forget you. And I think this one of the great matter to tell you how sincere is Khadija. Firstly, she was materialistically one of the most recognized women ever in the Mac in Mecca to reach in no need of anyone. Just imagine any woman like this, with few exceptions, you know, even the male, that's, uh, same thing, is going to be proud, is going to uh, be nasty, is going to be this and that. And she was completely the opposite. She accepted 
for sure we know the Prophet is much greater and much whatever, you know, per, but perhaps if we have any other woman in her position, not knowing the Prophet she will not get married to him. She accepted to get married to the Prophet She served him in a way, not in our time. In their time, it was a surprise to the Prophet How come you do this, you know, to me? And she, she answered him. Okay, so here, why did she do so? Just out of suspicion that this is the Prophet, okay? She sacrificed everything for this point. The Prophet ﷺ was the most beautiful, but she, she did not do this for beauty. She did not do this for use. She did not do this for this, for that. She did it for being closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Out of what? Suspicion. She was not quite sure. Nowadays, both sides, we are in no suspicion. Okay. You have the most confirmed a certain matter in your hand. I cannot imagine anything more confirmed that my, than my Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my, my uh, Quran, my Islam, my Prophet, okay? So uh, we have it in the well-formed, well-conformed way, okay? Let's see how we are going to sacrifice in this matter. How we are going to deal with it, okay? She had this suspicion, you know, she heard about it. Her cousin used to be one of those knowledgeable people, you know, of work, you know. And she heard about this and she suspected that the Prophet is the, the one. She tried to do some tricks, you know, she sent her slave, you know, with him, make him travel, you know, for trading and whatever. Perhaps she did not intend for trading or whatever. She wants to know this fact, you know. and. She sacrificed, okay, and she gained, alhamdulillah. And this is an indirect way, an indirect way. From, I would rather say in di indirect way, when the Prophet sallallahu answered her this, this answer, if I'm not the Prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to, going to forget you, okay? In other words, he's telling all of us, when you sacrifice anything, you know, for this certainty that you have in your hand, for sure Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to forget you, okay? Don't say, what's about my children? What's about my career? What's about my, my this or that, you know? When you give, give, give up anything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is not going to forget this, you know, for as mentioned by the Prophet Sallallahu and uh, at that time he did not receive revelation to tell him about this, but this is his knowledge about Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we look forward to have this knowledge, you know, about Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Other questions? Shall we have it? Yes? Regardless of what attracted him, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَإِنَّكَ بِأَعْيُنِنَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to choose to him the best. Okay? And we know now, now we know. Perhaps at that time we did not know it, you know, but now we know when he said, no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not make me get married to one better than her. Now we know the actual meaning of it. What attracted him to her, sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Yes. When you talk about arbitration, if we get that, or what sort of couple is it? Firstly, it is a couple of opportunities, isn't it? Or is it one person? I did not fully understand what you mean. You mentioned this couple is eight hundred years ago. Okay, okay. Yeah, this is mentioned in Surah An-Nisa. Okay, this is very, uh, anyone interested in this, go back and read it. It's verse 35 in chapter 4. Verse 35, okay. And here, the practice, whenever you have problem, okay, and perhaps 
the man is the most righteous one and the woman is the most righteous one okay but they don't fit with each other this is a possibility why why we say so because even in the time of the prophet some of the companions they divorce their wife you know and here again we have this bad thought usually it comes from the woman's side but it may come from the man's side what's wrong with me why did he divorce me okay and here you have the fitness you know uh, to fit each other, you know, may, they may not fit each other. They will have a problem. But in Islam, we are not going to go right away to divorce. What we are going to do, we are going to have an authority, a representative from the male side, and a representative from the female side. They will sit together, try to solve these problems, okay? And then we'll give them the decision. Is this marriage should carry on, continue, or it should be interrupted? Yes? When choosing those figures... Um, you choose, as a man, uh, from, your man uh, so, uh, from your side, you choose one from, from your side, and the woman is going to choose one from her side. But is there any sort of guidance as to who you choose in the society as arbitration? Yeah, I mean, uh, if I'm speaking about myself, you know, I would like to, to choose one love me and is religious, okay? This is going to protect me and is not going to go against the Islamic teaching, okay? These are the two items that I'm interested in, okay? I don't want him to attack me or work against me and I don't want him to bypass the Islamic rules, okay? But here, to best of my knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you the choice, you know, to select a person. Okay. Other, other questions? Shall we have break for 10 minutes or 5 or 10 minutes? Sorry, we are not speaking about Syria.